influenza. Influenza is a pretty important pathogen. Um, it kills millions of people. Um, the most famous pandemic was actually the Spanish flu, which took place in uh, 1918 to 1919. And that one actually killed about 20 to 40 million people. So that's kind of, it shows you the power of, you know, you think, oh, it's just a flu, but flu is actually really important. And that's actually more people than died during battles of World War I. Um, and pandemics have occurred with flu, you know, every so often. The most recent one was in 2009 with the H1N1. So it is an important pathogen that comes by every year that we actually really need to pay attention to and need to know. Okay, so what is the influenza virus? Well, it's a member of the Orthomyxoviridae family. It's actually the most important member of the Orthomyxoviridae family. This differentiates it from the paramyxoviruses, which we also talk in the camera talk about in the Camera Thompson um, Part Two self study guide. So, one of the things you can do as kind of a method for studying flu is to compare it. Um, to the paramyxoviruses because there's some important distinct distinctions there. Um, there are three types of flu, A, B, and C. Um, only A and B actually cause significant disease in humans, and actually only A is a zoonosis, um, is able to infect um, other animals. And that's actually really important um, because it's able to change the kind of genome of influenza A, which actually changes how we respond to it. And the fact that it's a zoonosis is actually what leads to some of those pandemics that I was just um, discussing. As I mentioned, it's one of the most important pathogens, I would say, on Earth. Um, as far as its structure goes, this is an enveloped negative sense RNA virus. Now, you know that most RNA viruses replicate in the cytoplasm and most DNA viruses replicate in the nucleus. This one is a little bit strange. Um, this is one of those important distinctions between the orthomyxoviridae and the paramyxoviridae. Um, this is an RNA virus that does kind of both, so it replicates sometimes in the um, cytoplasm and sometimes in the nucleus. So we're gonna go through the replication cycle of flu pretty in detail. Um, you need to kind of be able to understand the replication cycle of influenza virus because we have antivirals that interfere with it. One of the important things about the influenza virus genome is that it's segmented. Um, there are actually, I think, eight segments of RNA that make up the entirety of the genome. And these actually are what allow for the many different strains of virus. And it's also part of what allows for the genetic instability that we actually associate with annual epidemics of flu. And we're gonna talk about how that affects our responses to flu over time. Um, influenza virions can appear in kind of two different ways. They can be spherical, like is shown here, or they can be kind of tubular in shape. Um, they're enveloped and the capsid isn't going to actually restrict between these two um, structures. There are two glycoproteins that are contained within the envelope. The first you've heard of before, it's hemagglutinin. And the second one you've also heard of before, it's neuraminidase. And then there are also membrane proteins, which are um, the membrane pro proteins are known as M2. Um, and then an internally lined matrix protein, M1, which I don't think is here. It's this brown part here. That's the internally lining um, matrix protein. Um, the genome of the influenza virus actually consists of these eight different helical nucleocapsid segments. So each of the segments has its own nucleocapsid, and it contains a negative sense RNA that is associated with a nucleoprotein. And the nucleoprotein, or NP as it's known, um, is, and the uh, transcriptase, which are basically just the RNA polymerases. Um, and those can those are labeled PB1, PB2, and PA. So hemagglutinin actually has a couple of different functions that we're going to talk about. So as you can see here, it has this kind of um, spiked trimer shape, and it uses that basically to get at its three different functions. So each unit is basically activated by a protease. And this protease will actually cleave 
two subunits that are held together by this disulfide bond. And when it does that, it can mediate its three functions. So the first one, you already know, it needs to act as the viral attachment protein. That's how it attaches to the host cell. Specifically, it binds to sialic acid um, on host epithelial surfaces. Um, then, because it's binding to that acid and you're getting um, an increase in acid, you're going to promote fusion of the envelope to the cell membrane. So it's not just enough that it binds, it needs to promote fusion with the membrane. Because this is an enveloped virus, so we need to be able to fuse um, with the cell membrane. The other thing it does is it causes hemagglutination, which should make sense based on its name. Um, hemagglutination basically means that it binds and aggregates red blood cells. And it does this in numerous strains. I mean, we think about it in humans, but it also does it in chickens um, and in guinea pigs and other um, species as well. Um, and then the other thing it does that's helpful to us is that we actually elicit an antibody response. So um, it actually elicits the protective antibody response that's going to help us fight this virus eventually. And the antibody is actually a neutralizing antibody that will actually bind the HA and inhibit it from acting as a VAP eventually. Um, HA is really important because of this ability to promote antibody responses. And any changes in HA that are minor can actually change the types of antigens our bodies see and how we respond to the virus. So when you have changes in HA over time, that means the antibodies that you made, you know, one or two years ago, even if they're still around, they're no longer effective um, because the HA is so different that your body can't see it anymore. All right, neuraminidase, I'm not going to go into this too much because we talked about it in foundations, but basically it forms a tetramer and cleaves the sialic acid on glycoproteins, um, including the cell receptors for the virus. And this is actually how it's preventing clumping of the virus on the cell surface. So it's facilitating the release of the virus from the host cell once it's already been um, replicated within the cell. Um, and as you know, there are some antiviral drugs that actually work as neuraminidase inhibitors, most notably xanamivir and oseltamivir. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the influenza replication cycle. Okay, so part of it we already know, this step one, this is hemagglutinin binding to sialic acid on the host cell. And that's actually going to mediate the virus being endocytosed and fusing with a vest a vesicular membrane. And at that point, it's gonna be transferred to an endosome. Once that happens, you're gonna have further acidification of the endosome. And this is a really important step because the virus actually requires kind of a high um, acid content in order to uncoat. And if the virus doesn't uncoat, you don't expose the genome. And if you don't expose the genome, you don't replicate the virus. So you need to acidify that endosome. And that basically causes the HA to bend over. And it leads to the viral envelope fusing with that endosome membrane. And remember, that's one of the jobs of hemagglutinin. This whole process is actually facilitated by the protein M2. Um, M2 can be found, um, as I showed on the previous picture, it's kind of, picture, it's kind of a it's an ion channel and it can be found on, you know, on the virus. And basically this M2 protein promotes acidification of the envelope contents. And basically what it does is it breaks the interaction between M2 and the various um, NPs. And that basically allows for the uncoating. So if you can break that binding, then the virus will uncoat and you'll get delivery of the various nucleocapsids into the cytoplasm. Okay, so here's where the RNA virus stops behaving like an RNA virus and starts behaving like a DNA virus. These nucleocapsids are then basically shuttled into the nucleus where they can be transcribed into mRNA. And this is done using the, um, using the transcriptases. So PA, PB1, and PB2. So they'll use the host cell mRNA as actually a primer for the viral mRNA synthesis. And this is a really important step because they're gonna steal the methylated cap region of the host mRNA, basically so that later they can bind host ribosomes effectively and use the host ribosomes um, for translation. So all the genomic segments are gonna be transcribed into mRNA. 
for the individual protein segments. And this is except for M1, M2, and NS1 and NS2. Um, these are actually differentially spliced into two different mRNAs. All right, a little bit confusing, but follow along with me here. All right, so then the mRNAs are translated into protein back in the cytoplasm, okay? So we're gonna go back into the cytoplasm, and this is important because remember, we stole those, um, those uh, caps, we stole the host mRNA caps so that we could utilize the host ribosomes. So now you've got the mRNAs being translated into protein in the cytoplasm. On top of that, M2 has actually inserted itself into the membranes of both the ER and the Golgi. That's really important because what it's going to do is that it's actually going to protect the HA and the NA as they are actually created because you don't want too many modifications or too much acidification to happen that would actually dysregulate these or change their function. So you have M2 go into these and it actually acts as kind of like a reverse acid pump there, right? Because we're preventing the acidification that might damage um, these particular proteins. Okay, so once, once HA and NA are processed by the ER and the Golgi, they're going to be transported to the cell surface because we want them on the virion surface, surface eventually. Okay, now we still have to replicate our genome. So we're over here. We've got this positive sense RNA template for each segment, and they're made into a negative sense RNA genome, and it's replicated in the nucleus. The genomic segments will associate with polymerase and NP proteins basically to form the nucleocapsid. And the NS2 protein is actually then going to facilitate the transport of these ribonucleocapsids back into the cytoplasm, where they're going to interact with M2 lined plasma membrane sections, which contain your M2, HA, and NA. So that's kind of how everything then comes together at the cell surface, okay? The virus is then going to selectively bud from the apical surface because now everything has shown up right here. So you've got your M protein, your M1, you've got M2 that's preventing acidification, and that's around here too. You've got your HA and NA, and now you've got the segments and it's forming this nice little bud. And then neuraminidase is gonna cleave right here so that the virus can bud off. This whole process and is pretty complicated and it takes about eight hours. If what I just said doesn't make a lot of sense, go through the notes and if you need even further clarification, go to um, Murray's, go to the chapter in Murray's, that's the text and you can check it out there. That might be more helpful if you're still kind of having trouble conceptualizing this whole process. Okay, so as far as the pathogenesis goes, you could all probably describe the flu, but let's talk about some of the key characteristics of it. First off, it typically establishes a local upper, upper respiratory tract infection. Um, what happens is, is that basically it kills the mucus secreting cells in the upper respiratory tract. Um, it'll also kill the, the mucus secreting ciliated cells in the upper respiratory tract, and basically other epithelial cells. Even though it's a budding virus, eventually that still leads to cell death. Um, what this does when you remove mucus, cilia, and epithelial cells, hopefully you're kind of thinking, wait a minute, those are three of the major barriers to infection that our body has. So it's basically shutting down your innate immune barriers pretty effectively. Um, it can also cause lower respiratory infections, and in that case, it can cause pretty severe desquamation of the bronchial or alveolar epithelium. So just think of basically the same thing where we're killing epithelium, but we're doing it in a kind of a more sensitive place, isn't as hardy, okay? Um, and you can actually wear that down to kind of a single cell basal layer or the basement membrane. Um, and this actually is really uh, severe because this is actually what's gonna significantly increase the risk of developing pneumonia. And pneumonia is a really serious complication that occurs from being infected with the flu um, in a lot of people each year. Um, this is kind of a classic presentation. A patient gets the flu, they start to feel better, and then they suddenly feel way worse. And it's not necessarily because of the flu anymore, it's because they've developed pneumonia from some sort of secondary bacterial infection. Um, because it's made its way through the broken epithelial layer into the airways. Um, so it can be a viral process or it can be a bacterial process. 
So as far as the actual infection goes, though, how do they actually work with the immune system? Well, one of the things is they produce a lot of interferons. Interferon gamma is really heavily promoted during this, and that's actually like what leads to the flu-like symptoms that patients experience is all this interferon. Um, you get this systemic production, which can occur somewhere within three to four days of infection. Um, and this will occur almost at exactly the same time as the patients feel the symptoms. Um, what happens here though, is that since you get interferon gamma, you also get a lot of T cell production, which is great. You get T cell engagement. When you get T cell engagement, you also get better antibody engagement. And specifically the antibody engagement is gonna lead to future protection. Because remember, we want those antibodies to be able to bind and neutralize the viruses so that they're unable to get in to our epithelial cells. That's kind of the main way that we, excuse me, protect ourselves in the future. Um, so the T cell responses are actually pretty important for affecting recovery, but the antibody responses are what are actually going to prevent disease in the future. Okay, so since the antibody response is so important for future protection, we need to kind of figure out why and how that affects our design of vaccines and what we expect each year. So your vaccine for the flu contains basically different H and NA segments or HANA segments that our bodies see differently and are non-cross-reactive with the previous um, batch, the previous vaccine batch. So for instance, H1N1 responds to a different antibody response than say H2N4. These antibodies will not protect you from H1N1 and vice versa because of the lack of cross-reactivity. Now, if you just have some minor changes in how H or N appears to your body. So just, you know, minor differences in the genetic code. That's called antigenic drift. And that's what happens every year. So that's kind of the change um, in general from, you know, one H1 to another H1 or H1 to H2. These are minor changes in the genome. These aren't rearrangements. And this can happen in influenza A virus or influenza B virus. Um, it doesn't really matter. But what we, when we get these pandemics, as we pre periodically do, this is actually a result of a concept known as antigenic shift. Antigenic shift is rearrangement of gene segments from completely different strains of virus. And this actually only happens in influenza A virus, which as I mentioned before, is a zoonosis. And that's actually really important. So many of you have probably heard of like bird flu um, or uh, chicken flu, like we can find some of these viruses in animals years before we'll actually see them in humans. But because we have kind of a close relation with some of these birds, I don't mean genetically, I mean like physically, you know, we farm birds, so we have humans that spend time among them. We have the chance to be infected from a bird because it's a zoonosis. And this is actually what we kind of see. And it's how we wound up with the H1N1 virus that was such a problem in 2009 and actually caused the most recent pandemic. So if we follow this backward, the N1 actually came from a Eurasian swine virus, ES6. So that we can find over here. And the H1 actually came from a different swine virus, S4, which we can first find over here. So what happens is you have a cell that is infected with both of these strains. So we had Eurasian swine 4, so ES4 was in this cell, and S4 was in this cell. And the gene, remember this is a segmented genome, so the gene segments rearranged such that we wound up with a virus that had H1N1 as its nucleocapsid. On its uh, as its proteins, right? So H1, N1. And this was different enough from the other strains that had been previously circulating 
that we didn't have a large protective antibody pool in our population. So we saw a much more significant disease that year than we had in other years. But you can see where it came from, that it actually came all the way from this S4, which went into one pig. That was a triple reassortment between a North avian virus, a human H3N2, which was a virus that was circulating prior to this, and a swine virus. Then you had another set of reassortments into another pig. So this came from this pig, got rearrangements from these three species. This pig got from this pig and from this pig. And then we got infected from a pig that had all of them. So you can see in here, you've got S4, and then you've got components of ES4 in one of these viruses. And that led to H1N1 in humans. So it's these major genetic reassortments that lead to these massive changes that are nothing close to any antibodies that any antigens that our bodies have seen before. So we don't have a lot of protection within the population. Okay, so if I asked you all to describe the flu to me, you undoubtedly could, but let's just talk about it for completed for completeness sake. Okay, so first off, when you get exposed to the flu, there's about a one to four day incubation period before you start feeling ill, okay? Um, this is actually determined by the extent of the viral and immune killing of epithelial tissue, and remember, cytokine action, because the flu-like feeling is actually due to interferon. Um, thankfully, flu is normally pretty self-limited, but you get this acute onset of symptoms. Um, the good news is it's relatively pretty quick. Um, within about three to eight days or four to six days, um, a person is going to start to feel a little bit better because the fever will end and they'll be completely cured normally by about seven to ten days. Um, it starts with kind of a prodrome, that malaise, headache, I'm just feeling a little bit run down. By the next day, you're going to have uh, more significant fever, significant pain, um, lack of appetite, weakness, fatigue. Some patients report a sore throat, and it's a non-productive cough at this point. If it's a productive cough, then that could mean something different, lower respiratory infection. Um, but if for your average course, it's going to be, remember, an upper respiratory infection with a non-productive cough. In kids, we can see a slightly different disease. Um, with kids, sometimes we see um, this bronchiolitis, uh, sometimes croup, uh, that kind of seal bark cough, um, otitis media, ear infections. Um, sometimes you'll get vomiting and abdominal pain with kids, so you can get like some dehydration there as well. As I mentioned before, this can be significantly complicated by the presentation of pneumonia. Um, it can become you can develop pneumonia as a result of just the viral process, but more likely it's secondary bacterial infection. And typically the secondary bacterial infection is due to an, a streptococcal organism, streptococcus pneumoniae. So it's very aptly named for once. Um, but it can also be due to like Staph aureus or another organism which we haven't talked about yet, Haemophilus influenza. The other significant complication you're going to watch out for is Rye syndrome. This is actually an acute encephalitis that typically affects children, um, and it occurs after a variety of acute febrile illnesses. Flu is just one of them. Um, it actually is significantly associated with giving children aspirin, so we don't typically recommend that people give their children aspirin anymore. Um, children who are given aspirin get have a significantly increased risk of developing Rye syndrome. And if a child develops Rye syndrome, the mortality rate is pretty high. It's like 40%. Diagnosis, go ahead and check out Camera Thompson Part 1 just to refresh yourself on this. But we've been through this. You've got your rapid influenza test. Um, you can do PCR. And each year, some of them are cultured so that we can find out um, those genes that might lead to um, antigenic drift or shift, um, as I was just talking about on the last slide. Okay, treatment, again, you can check out Camera Thompson for this one. Um, Tamiflu is obviously an option. When we think about it, though, you wanna make sure that you're treating appropriately. Um, most people, like I said, it's uncomplicated and they're going to recover. However, if you've got um, pregnant women or somebody who's immunocompromised, um, people over the age of 50, anyone who might have trouble clearing the virus, you're probably going to wanna give them Tamiflu if it's still an option. Um, 
but better than treating is to get people vaccinated. Um, while the vaccine doesn't always hit spot on each year, it certainly does ameliorate the course of infection. Um, so getting your yearly flu vaccine is really important. Um, it's routinely recommended for all individuals, especially people who are older than 50 years, healthcare workers like you, pregnant women, especially those who will be in their second or third trimester during flu season, um, people living in a nursing home or in you know close contact, um, people with chronic pulmonary heart diseases and others at high risk. Um, all children who are five to 18 years old should be vaccinated. It's, it's an excellent public health initiative. Um, however, there is one caveat. The vaccine is often created in chicken eggs because remember it can infect both. Um, so if you have a serious allergy to egg, you might want to avoid the vaccine or get um, a different formulation of the vaccine that might be available. You can get a tissue culture generated vaccine instead.